Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live TV Peer Exchange. This program features expert panel discussions with a focus on current and emerging therapies for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. In particular, we will be highlighting advances in immunotherapy, second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and maintenance therapy. My name is Corey Langer. I'm the director of thoracic oncology at the Abramson Cancer Center in the University of Pennsylvania. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Mark Chris, Professor of Thoracic Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Benjamin Levy, Director of Thoracic Medical Oncology at Beth Israel Hospital and Mount Sinai Health System, Mark Szynski, Professor of Medicine, University of Pittsburgh, and Heather Wakeley, Associate Professor, Stanford University School of Medicine. Thank you again for joining us. Let's get started. Our first focus will be recent advances in targeting uh, immunologic uh, approaches in non-small cell. And uh, I think we'll begin this section uh, with a brief overview. Um, ben, uh, if you can uh, talk about some of the early findings on nivolumab and uh, uh, start the discussion there. Sure. I think uh, this class of drugs has generated uh, considerable enthusiasm within the thoracic community for good reason. I think historically speaking, immunotherapeutic approaches in, in lung cancer have failed. Uh, and this class of drugs has ushered in a new era, uh, working by suppressing uh, inhibitory signaling in the immune system, basically uncamouflaging the tumor cell and allowing uh, the T cells to recognize it. Uh, one of the uh, uh, drugs that was uh, presented uh, at World Lung was the nivolumab. It's an anti-PD-1 uh, inhibitor. Uh, it looked at 129 patients uh, and interestingly, this is a highly uh, pretreated group of patients, and um, on all doses, the response rate was 17 percent, uh, and a duration of a response of 18 months with a median survival of uh, nine, nine and a half months. I think, interestingly, at the three milligram per kilogram dose, uh, we saw a response rate that was a little higher, uh, around 25 percent, uh, with survival times uh, ranging uh, in the 12 to 15 months. I think um, uh, just as important was uh, there was duration of response for, for all histologies. Uh, and just as important is that the toxicity was manageable in these drugs. I think efficacy is one thing, but I think the adverse events, uh, not that they're not there, they are, uh, but grade three, four adverse events were uh, less than 5%. So I think uh, this uh, really is an exciting time. Uh, this drug is, uh, I've had some experience with this drug in my uh, practice in, in clinical trial, uh, and my experience uh, with my patients has mirrored the data. The perception is that this drug is a bit less toxic than the CTLA-4 inhibitor, specifically uh, ipilimumab. I think so. I think what, we're, what we saw with ipilimumab, at least in, in the study by Lynch, was higher rates of grade 3, 4 adverse events. And we're not seeing that uh, with, with these drugs, not to say that they don't have some toxicity that needs uh, a little more vigilance in managing, but uh, overall very well tolerated. So there are several other uh, compounds. Uh, the uh, uh, Merck compound, MK3475, has also demonstrated activity, um, an ongoing phase one. Same basic setting, um, highly pretreated uh, patients with response rates that are in the 20% uh, range. The initial response, immune-related response, was about 24%. Uh, Overall median PFS of about two months, but many of these responses, when they do occur, seem to be quite durable, and some of these last even after the... Uh, the agents are uh, halted. Uh, not quite so much data with the uh, um, Merck compound as there is with the uh, BMS, the nivolumab compound, but fairly similar. Uh, similar toxicity profiles, uh, uh, similar issues regarding pseudoprogression and, uh, and immune-mediated uh, events. Um, Heather, uh, comments uh, perhaps on the uh, Genentech compound? Um, sure. So uh, this one's a little bit different. Uh, the first two compounds we talked about are PD-1 inhibitors, and the uh, Genentech compound, which is the MPDL uh, 3280A, um, doesn't quite have a cute name yet. Um, so that is actually targeting the PDL one, so the ligand to PD-1. So it's a slightly different compound, similar concept. Mm -hmm. Um, and a little bit uh, less data than we have with nivolumab as well. We have much, uh, there's just been the first few reports that have come out this year. Heard a little bit about the European meeting and then a, a bit of an update at the World Long Conference. Um, it's been interesting that some of the 
the data that's come out is that they're, they're tending to see higher responses in patients with a smoking history, um, which is you know not something we always think about. Um, makes some sense that it might be more of an immunogenic tumor, but uh, I, I think there's a lot we still need to learn about these compounds and how, uh, um, how they are going to distinguish themselves from each other. Well, response rates were very similar to very, the uh, very Merck similar, and the BMS right, compound. Right. And I think uh, one thing I, we certainly need to talk about is the, the biomarkers that are emerging potentially or not, um, with the PDL1 expression mm -hmm. being the main one that's come out. And when we were first were learning about uh, nivolumab with the initial New England Journal publications, um, they had looked at PDL1 expression as a biomarker there, which was intriguing. Um, and with the uh, Genentech presentations, it's been a similar sort of story where when they're seeing PDL1 expression with their assay, and it's important to note that their assay isn't the same as the assays for PDL1 that everybody else is using. So you have three separate companies developing three separate compounds, all with different assays. Exactly. Um, but with the Genentech PDL1 assay, when they see high levels, they're having good response rates. Um, you know, in one very small data presentation, there were six patients, five of whom, who, six patients with the PDL1 expression being high, five of them had a response. So that's a pretty high response rate. It's very small numbers, though, so it's, we don't know if that's going to hold true. As I recall with both the Genentech and certainly, frankly, I think as well with the Merck and BMS uh, compounds, uh, the absence of expression did not preclude responses. Certainly the response rates were lower, but you could still see some responses. Right. So when we talk about these drugs, the PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, and there's one other PD-L1 inhibitor in development made by a Metamune, um, but with these drugs, there's a lot of work being done trying to figure out a good biomarker, and the PD-L1 expression is the leading contender for that. There was a, a companion article in the New England Journal, original publication of the nivolumab, showing that pd one expression seemed to correlate with response to the compound. However, each company is developing their own pd one antibody, and so it's hard to know which one's uh, going to be the truth, the gold standard. Um, We've, in all of the places where this has been looked at, all of the different compounds, the response rates are higher when the pd one expression is positive. Um, most strikingly, I think, with the Genentech compound, um, at the World Lung, there was a discussion that for six patients who had very high expression, five of them had responses. Now, those are very small numbers, but it's a high response rate. The absence of expression does not preclude response. Certainly lower response mm -hmm. rates, but um, not necessarily an exclusionary criteria. Correct. However, some of the trials that are in development, and they're, every company that's developing these compounds has multiple trials in development right now looking at it versus chemo in combination with chemo in combination with targeted drugs. So there's a lot of exploration being done. But some of those trials are excluding patients who have the pd one expression, who don't have it, who don't have the pd one expression on their tumors. And I think that's an area of debate. Is it too early to make that leap? Or do we really need to still be exploring the differences between the tumors that do and don't express by the different assays? So I, I think we're still a little too early to make that leap. Could, could I weigh in Mark, on that a little absolutely. bit? Absolutely. You know, I, I do think I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, I, I've heard a few lectures from Li Ping Cheng, who, uh, one of the, uh, who's now at Yale, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the uh, uh, cloners of uh, pd one and it, he has a very nice paradigm for melanoma, and he's now recapitulated that in lung cancer, where responses to these agents are, are much more common where you have T cells in the tumor and you have PDL1 expression. You then have the situation where you have T cells but no PDL1, PDL1 with no T cells, and then you have neither. And, and as you go down that, you see very different um, responses, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. So I, this is probably targeted therapy. And, and to make it work, you need PDL1, you need T cells, uh, and the more you have that. Um, this issue, I and mean, Heather brought up already, you know, the different antibodies. Um, there's a lot of other uh, technical uh, points I think worth mentioning. The first is that, remember, we're suddenly looking at generally biopsies in metastatic patients, which are tiny pieces of tissue. You know, the, a lot of this biopsy stuff is surgical mm -hmm. specimens. That's not what we're looking at in these patients. So there's a lot of heterogeneity just by the biopsy specimen. The second thing is when you have a big biopsy specimen, there's heterogeneity of this staining. 
I mean, you might see some focal, very high positivity in one section, but very little in another part. So you feel it's premature to exclude patients with uh, low expression? No, I think it, studies? for this development, they should be excluded because but it's well, this it's possible, drug. It could be a sample. It is, here. but I would see that as a second uh, area of research, I think a reasonable one, but I would do that second, not first. I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with that as an initial strategy. I mean, yeah. there's so much pressure to get a drug approved. And the whole um, uh, focus in oncology is targeted agents and targeted patients. Uh, I agree with Mark's comments about tumor heterogeneity. Uh, mm -hmm. You may not necessarily uh, see a reflection of the true tumor status with a small biopsy. And therefore, we shouldn't be excluding patients. And those studies, I think, should come secondary. With, they shouldn't, shouldn't be excluded uh, in those uh, populations. I think it's, being, uh, it's, it's occurring too early. I to, think to you should do separate patients. studies, perhaps, but not automatically exclude folks with uh, uh, absent expression. Well, no one's doing that, actually. Yes, I mean, uh, several studies. Oh, no, no, I mean, tech, practically, yes, but the, the goal is to, to find every single patient that could benefit from right. this. But the same thing happened in breast cancer when HER2 was discovered. They had to focus in on a group, and they did. On a targeted group. And then they did yeah. a lot of research on people that didn't have the target, and that's, I think, the way it should be done. I, I would just want to weigh in and, and say, you know, I, I agree with Corey. I think it's a little too early to exclude patients at this time just based on uh, expression by IHC and also comment that IHC is quite subjective mm -hmm. and we don't really have a standard way uh, to across institutions to determine uh, who's really IHC uh, pd one positive and who's not. So I think until we have that or until we uh, redefine our molecular subsets for these groups of patients, I don't, I don't think we should be excluding them. Well, I think that's, that's mm -hmm. part of the, the um, frustration with trying to get your head around this mm -hmm. whole area. As he Heather said, everyone has a different antibody, a different assay, a different cutoff point. As you say, IHC has a subjective component to it. it what's the better target, PDL1 or PD1? Uh, you know, we have some fundamental uh, questions. Some are approaching this in a binary way. It's positive or negative, and others right. are actually looking at degree of staining. Right. right. And, and I think that that's my concern, is that if we rush too quickly into saying, OK, this is targeted, we know the target, this is, these are the patients who should get it and these who, who don't, and we haven't really defined the target that well, I have concerns. Um, but, but I think Mark's point is a mm -hmm. good point in, in that you can find some subset, mm -hmm. we could argue about the percentage of that, where this therapy is much more likely to be effective than other populations. Right. And if your interest is, is getting new therapies to our lung cancer population, I think that's the most appropriate strategy. And then worry about the rest uh, of the population once you have a drug out there and available.